Welcome to Artificiality, the podcast by Helen and Dave Edwards from Saunders Studio. We created Saunders Studio to empower humans in our complex age of machines and data. Our research-based, design-oriented consulting and education services help you and your organization work better with machines and data. You can learn more about us at GetSonder.com. What role does design have in solving the world's biggest problems? What can designers add? Some would say that designers played a role in getting us into our current mess. Can they also get us out of it? How do we design solutions for problems in complex systems that are evolving, emerging, and changing? To answer these questions, we talked with Don Norman about his book, Design for a Better World, Meaningful, Sustainable, Humanity-Centered. In his book, Don proposes a new way of thinking, one that recognizes our place in a complex global system, where even simple behaviors affect the entire world. He identifies the economic metrics that contribute to the harmful effects of commerce and manufacturing, and proposes a recalibration of what we consider important in life. Don Norman is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Cognitive Science and Psychology and Founding Director of the Design Lab at the University of California, San Diego, from which he has retired twice. Don is also retired from and holds the Emeritus title from Northwestern University, the Nielsen Norman Group, and a few other organizations. He was an Apple Vice President, has been an advisor and board member for numerous companies, and has three honorary degrees. His numerous books have been translated into over 20 languages, including The Design of Everyday Things and Living with Complexity. It was a true pleasure to talk with Don, someone who we have read and followed for decades. His work is central to much of today's design practices, and we love talking with him about where he hopes design may take us. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to talking with you today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Let's start with, uh, I'd love to ask you, what inspired you to write um, this new book? What inspires me to write any book? Um, I like to study things that I don't understand. So anytime I find a topic that excites me, and I, but I don't have any clue about it and I don't really understand it, I walk around sort of not understanding for several years, uh, could be a lot of years actually, and in fact, I'm convinced my students all think that I don't know anything because they mostly see me during this in-between period. And then it starts to click. And I have a theory about myself, which is, it's actually an old theory, but that I read a lot and I talk to people a lot and I travel a lot. And I, I'm curious and always looking at things and observing things. And it fills up my brain, the subconscious part of the brain with all this stuff. And what the subconscious does is it's sort of a, it's a big, complex neural network. And um, it it's sort of juggling it around. And it, every so often it finds cohesion. And cohesion in the, uh, in the models that we talk about is a low energy state. And that's a good thing. And so it sort of signals the conscious mind, hey, there's something there. Come look at it. And uh, there was a Poincaré, a mathematician in France, uh, described this many, like a hundred years ago and said, but the, the subconscious is very smart about finding patterns, but it doesn't have any intelligence. So for example, it can't do arithmetic. So it prods the conscious and you wake up in the middle of the night or distracted from whatever you're doing with this new thought, but you have to check it out. And most of them don't work, but the ones that do work are breakthroughs. And that's kind of what happens to me. And uh, and then I decided, it's, oh, it's time to put this together into a course, into a book, to a lecture. And I try them out. And I'm always writing. But I need a storyline to connect it. And uh, it isn't until I get the storyline that I can write the book. And quite often, it's just the title. But the title, in some sense, is a synopsis. And so that's what happened here. But what happened was what happened in the world. So the world was changing. The world was going to hell. And uh, we had race riots. We had racial prejudice coming, though. It, we've always had that. But for the first time, people were really seriously saying, we got to stop this. The Black Lives Matter, um, Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, for that matter, the, the whole problem with women and gender equality. And then there was an the anti-colonialist movement that says, hey, you know, you Western powers have gone and taken over. 
et cetera, et cetera. And um, it all came together. And I was trying to figure out what I could do about it. And uh, several different things happened. I won't list them all because that would take the whole show. But a number of different things happened, which really started to change my whole perspective. Um, some of it was talking to the people in these various movements. Um, but I also remembered I had read a book by um, Terry Winograd, Winograd and Flores, many years ago. I've been a good friend of Terry for a long time, and, his, and he had run this wonderful work on natural language understanding using computers, and he wrote this book with Flores basically saying everything he did in the past was completely wrong and wouldn't lead anywhere. And I read the book, and I was kind of confused by it and didn't quite know what to make of it. And now about 10 years later, or even more, I was, I'm trying to figure out what I sh how I can piece together what's happening. I remembered his book and I went back and read it. And I said, and I wrote to Terry, hey, this book really makes sense today. And I think the problem is you published it too early and people weren't ready for it. So evidently Terry told Flores and Flores, Flores is an interesting person. He used to be finance minister of Chile in the Allende regime. And so after the military overthrew the regime because it was socialist, socialistic, et cetera, um, he spent a number of years in jail in Chile. And after that, he came to the United States and he went off to Berkeley and got a PhD in philosophy. And that's how he met Terry. Um, and so anyway, so Flores calls me up and wants to check me out, whether I know what I'm talking about which I don't, but whether it's at least it's an interesting way that I don't know. And uh, he started telling me what he was thinking. And I interrupted and said, you know, um, I've been reading uh, some, some works by a, an author and it, it's very similar to what you're saying. And I think you ought to meet this person, Arturo Escobar, who's talking about um, the plural verse and uh, what, and the kinds of difficulties we've had in all the, you know, basically the, the, uh, prejudices against people of different cultures. And <laughs> Flores laughs. Why are you laughing? He was my student. And so, <laughs> so he, we formed a, a meeting group that met every week for like two years uh, with Flores, with Arturo, with Terry, with me, and with a, a person who calls himself B, a letter B, who was a PhD, has a PhD in philosophy and works for uh, Flores. And we went through a lot of literature, and that really gave me a better theoretical background of what I was worrying about. And so when I started to write the book, I tried to figure out there's a lot going on and a lot of really good people talking about it, and they didn't need me. And a lot of the Black Lives Matter and, and the, the, the women's movement and this, that, and the other, I, I thought everybody, but the people I read were doing a good job, and I didn't see where I could add anything. So. Uh, what could I add? And I decided that what I was, was my knowledge was really about, I know about technology, I know about people, and I know a reasonable amount, of, amount about the world and I'm learning more and more, still learning more and more. And uh, so it's a combination uh, that I thought I was good at. And so I decided I would write a book, but picking the topics where I thought I had a unique voice and could add some insight. And that's how this book came about. Um, it actually was quite different when I finished it. It was called Four Maxims to Change the World. And I had four major philosophies that we do each of these four. And um, some of my favorite publishers turned it down. Uh, and one publisher was really bizarre. He said, I really would like to publish a book by Don Norman, but, but this isn't the right book. And I think it could be turned into it, but he's worked so hard to make this, he would never spend the time to revise it properly. Well, MIT Press read the book and they really liked it. And they made the same criticism of it. Well, but I like criticism. I, I learn a lot. And the whole point about criticism is it teaches me a lot. I tell people, if you say you like what I'm doing, well, that's nice to hear but I don't learn anything. If you say, no, you're doing it all wrong and you're intelligent about it, that's wonderful. Because if I'm wrong, I, I want to know. I'll change what I'm doing. And if, I, if I'm convinced I'm not wrong, 
Well, that means I'm not explaining myself well. So I learned in either case. And um, so basically, uh, together with my uh, editor, we completely restructured the book and I rewrote the book. But rewriting the book isn't as hard as some people think because I've discovered now several times in my career, I've completely rewritten books, but I mostly, I didn't change many words. The rewriting is putting a new perspective, a new theme on it and reordering the material, throwing away some, restructuring some, writing some new stuff. But most of the stuff stayed. And that's what I did with this book. And so the poor editor who said, I would never take the time. Well, he was wrong. He never, he should have asked me. Uh, so what I did was I focused upon, I started with history. I started by saying, look, the world, I look around. In fact, I just looked right out that window where I'm in the room I'm sitting. And I took a picture because I and I that's the first that's the first illustration of the book and the first sentence of the book. I look out the window and it's wonderful. And I see this, that and the other. And it's all artificial. Most of it's artificial. I see Mission Bay, a wonderful recreation area. Well, it used to be a swamp. I see there's grass in front of well. Not grass, but yeah, grass. And I there's rabbits here, and there are about eight or nine, ten different species of birds. And um, are they natural or are they real? Well, the habitat that allows them to live here is artificial because this is a, this used to be a steep hill. It still is a steep hill, but the place where I'm living was flattened out, and uh, the trees were loaded with palm trees. They're all planted by people. And so everything, in fact, I see in the background, I can actually see Mexico. Now, you know, in some sense, the hills that I see are true, but the division between Mexico and the United States, the nation notion of countries is artificial. The notion of country boundaries is artificial. And that particular boundary, why it's there is there's big historical fights and battles between the Spanish and the Mexicans and the Indians and the Americans, uh, all artificial. And I said... Well, that means it was designed. And if it was designed, maybe designers can get us out of the problem. But we have to change the way design is done because designers today couldn't do it. They don't have enough education. They're, they're trained in art schools. And I need them to be trained as generalists to understand history. And so I talk a lot about history and point out that, well, anyway, I can go on and on and on, and, but that's how I got to this book. And it just sort of, once I got the idea and the theme, it flowed. And I said, I'm going to start talking about everything being artificial and the history that has led us to this point. And then I'm going to talk about meaning. Scientists and others talk in ways that are meaningful to them, but not to the ordinary person. And economists are one of the worst offenders because they love to measure everything and they measure it in dollars and they talk about the gross product, the gross domestic product of a company, which is a meaningless number. Because what it does is it tells you how much the, com the country spends, whether for good or for evil. They, it, it, both of them help make this number it goes bigger. And uh, no, that isn't the way to do it. And trying to take a single number to summarize a very complex thing is wrong. We do that, by the way, with intelligence. We make we measure intelligence with an intelligence test. And that tells you how intelligent the person is. And what it really tells you is how well that person can take an intelligence test. And that correlates highly with how well you do in school taking tests. But it does not correlate well very well at all with how well you do in the world. Because the world doesn't give you lots of tests. That's not how the world works. With tests that you answer with pencil and paper. And why do they try to summarize this complex thing, us, and the way we get around in the world with a single number? So that became a theme of my meaningful section. And on top of that, it was that everybody measures, and the economists love to measure things, especially people, and they don't understand people. They have no knowledge of people. They have this artificial notion of a logical being who knows everything, which is false. And um, there, are, there are some economists who are doing good work. And so I talk about the good folks doing good work. And a long time ago, Sir um, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, said that if you can't measure something, you means you don't understand it. And that is what has driven a lot of the social scientists and the economists to measure everything. 
And the, the, the social scientists at least have better sensible measures. Some of them are qualitative and there's division between qualitative and quantitative. It's not a sharp division. So we can measure a lot of qualitative things, but in a rigorous way. But the economists insist on measuring everything in terms of monetary terms. And yet, when that isn't quite what Lord Kelvin said. He said four words before that sentence, which everybody forgets. He said, in the physical sciences, if you cannot measure, you don't understand. And that's because history doesn't matter to the physical science. If I drop something and I drop it again, oof, the fact that it fell down does not, I could pick it up again and drop it again, and it'll drop at the same speed in the same way. It, it, its history does not impact what it's doing. But if I pick up a person and drop them, and then I pick it up, pick up the person and try to drop them again, no, the history matters. And um, it, with people and with anything that's alive in the social sciences, especially, the history determines the behavior. And what we, in, in science, it's often called path independence versus path dependence. So path independence is what the physicists love. Uh, because it means if I can tell you what state you're in now, it doesn't matter how you got there. But that's not true of human beings. Yet we continue. Yeah, well, that's a, we're, we're constantly um, changing and, and interdependent and complex. And uh, one of the things that um, that sort of popped out to me about the book was um, this idea of, of how to start thinking about um, – artificial constructs and design in a much more almost fluid way where and designers um, become so much more about uh, sort of stitching the seams between people who are strangers to each other and trying to make um, things that work. So trying to break down those us and them barriers and trying to um, solve problems of cooperation um, in a different way, not in that anthropological way where you, where you walk in and, um, and, and observe what people are doing and then tell them what they need to do instead, but more in a softer, almost coaching, almost leading, sort of leading from behind kind of way. Um, but I wasn't sure whether that was just an interpretation that occurred to me <laughs> or whether it was sort of something that you part of what you were trying to communicate um oh that was it, very nice let let me expand on that um because you're what you're saying is is almost what i was trying to say uh, but uh what you're saying is the conclusion of where i was going but i was also trying to say that isn't how it is the way designers Design started as a tool of industry in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to paint pottery in the Wedgwood factory so it would sell better. And uh, and over and over again, that's what design's role is, is to help industry sell their products. And so over time, uh, we've changed our methods. And so the current method is called human-centered design, where we try to do the anthropological studies and try to understand. But nonetheless, we still design for people. And we say, here's a new cell phone, or here's a new automobile, here's a new stove, here's a new whatever. And people have to figure out how to work it and use it and adapt to it. Uh, and I'm saying that that isn't, that's colonialism in many ways. Now, it may not, it may be necessary in mass manufacturing when you're, mag- when you're making millions of products the same to go to around people around the world. So you can't tailor it for each individual person. But when you're talking about societal issues where there's a lack of food or a lack of sanitation or a lack of good farming techniques or whatever, what happens is that the the big foundations and the government agencies and international agencies send in all the experts who spend time and they analyze it and the experts figure out what the issues are and they're correct. And then they figure out a solution and then they produce a $10 billion plan that will take 10 or 20 years And people say, yes, do it. And they almost always fail, spend twice as much money as they plan, take twice as much time, and it still fails. And that's because they don't do what you described, 
What you really want to do is you want to go in and say, oh, there are really problems here. But the, the experts, when they do this, they don't understand the culture and the capabilities and the, and the ways that these people think. So what you want to do is say, hey, there are 8 billion people in the world. And when I go into this new area, uh, I bet there are lots of intelligent people there. They not, may not be educated. That doesn't stop them from being intelligent. And they already understand the problems. They don't know, need me to tell them what they are. And they've already started to try to figure out the solutions. So let me... Let me assist them. Let me be a mentor. Let me help and facilitate. Let me bring in extra resources. And also, quite often, they attack the symptoms and not the real underlying cause. And it's not because they don't understand that there's a more fundamental cause underneath, but that requires more resources than they have to bear. And that's where we can help. So what you described was the ideal thing, but most designers don't work that way. Today. It's interesting. We... um... Yeah, we on our in our last interview we um, we talked with Jamer Hunt from Parsons about his book Not to Scale, and one of the things he talks about in his book and we discussed in the podcast was um, uh, Charles and Ray Eames um, move uh, video um, movie it's um, you know Powers of Ten, and um, this sort of moment in time which was obviously so long ago now and i actually went back and watched it again just recently because i thought it was interesting and the premise is that it starts with a a one meter by one meter square and a in a park in chicago and then it goes back by powers of 10 and then it comes back in and it zooms all the way into the skin and sees so much more and I, i found this interesting moment when hearing about you talking about how designers work today, sort of the history of design and kind of where you wanted to go. And I'm having this flashback of feeling like th- that video is something that everyone should watch when they're starting to think about being a designer is to be able to able to step all the way back. And it goes all the way where it's not just looking at the earth. You're so far back that you're looking at the solar system before it starts to zoom back in again. And There's something about scale that is interesting. And you talk about scale in the book because you're thinking about how design can actually, um, can, can actually approach some of these planetary level, you know, sort of problems. Yes. I'm, I'm curious how you think about that in that, you know, the, there's sort of the iconic time of design, you know, building things, you know, start at the beginning of the industrial revolution, you know, and I think the whole world kind of wanted to get into design because Apple became successful, um, you know, but it was always about how do we design a great, a, a great thing. And you're trying to say, step back and see the entire picture at a different level of scale and think about it that way. Yes. Because we're part of a complex world. And yes. this is what the, that's what we discussed a lot in the conversation group that I went into every single week, discussed this a lot. But, and the whole point was to take a look at the world as a complex system. And we are part of that system. We aren't outside observers looking at it. That's how I, most people think about it. So I'm going to change the world. So I'm here looking at the world and we do this and here's a change. No, no, I'm in the world. And if I change the world, guess what? The world changes me. It's circular. And um, everything I do changes things which end up changing the way people behave, which ends up changing me. And so it's a very complex system and you have to appreciate it. We took the notion in the beginning and and I think people are evolutionarily, you know, born to think in very simple linear terms and very simple causality. I do something and there's an immediate response. And if I do something and there's no response for a long time, then it's really hard to recognize that what you did was responsible. And, uh, And we also think in linear terms. And in fact, many people can't even master the thermostat, which is the first feedback loop. And so you walk into the cold house and you're really cold. And so you turn the thermostat all the way up to maximum, thinking that will make it faster. Well, it doesn't. And et cetera, et cetera. But when you in the world, there are many feedback loops and there's something called feed forward loops. And they're not necessarily linear. And some of them could take a decade to have an impact. And we used to think the world was infinite, that we could throw stuff away because look, as far as I can see, there's it keeps going and going and the ocean is infinite. That people said the ocean is infinite, an infinite source of food, an infinite source of materials and stuff. But no, no, we're 8 million, 8 billion people today and over many, many generations, 
thousands, tens of thousands of years, we've destroyed the earth. And so we have to change. Designers who make these wonderful, beautiful things, looking for one of them, um, no. You're trying to make them lightweight and small and thin and wonderful. They only last about two years, but that's good for business. So they, my phone dies, I have to buy a new one. My computer goes out of date, so I have to buy a new one. Um, the plan obsolescence is great for business. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, it's, in the fa it's built into the fashion industry. Uh, it's how automobiles have long been built and sold. And that destroys the world. And we can't, we can't just meld stuff together to make it beautiful and thin if you have to throw it away when you're finished and you can't repair it. So it's time that we completely change the way we do things. Now, in 1971, Victor Papanek, a famous designer at the time, said in the first sentence of his book, Design for the Real World, he said, there is no field more dangerous than design because it makes all this crap that we have to buy and throw away and it's not, we don't even really need it. Well, he wasn't quite right. I think his, his point of view was correct, but it, don't blame the designers because designers have always been these people in the middle. No, most companies don't take, treat them as important. Yeah, we need to have a design team, but they're not part of the board of directors. They're not part of the, of the C-suite. They're not one of the major executives. Uh, they don't make decisions. They're artists. Who would make, who would, who would use an artist to make a business decision? And, uh, even in universities, the design de department or school was never considered the best, the most important one in the school. And then where there are specialized schools for design, they're almost always art and design. Devana College of Art and Design, Ontario College of Art and Design, et cetera. But, but we aren't artists. Art is when you're doing something to make an expression. You want to change the world. You want people to know your feeling or you have a new way of viewing something or whatever. That's nice. It's important. I love art. I buy art. I use art. But design is designing for other people. And that's very different than art. And when I'm asked to, to help improve a sewage system, or I, I was in Bangalore, India, and we were talking about the fact that people are throwing their trash in the streets on the sidewalks, uh, the men are urinating on the walls in, in the streets, and uh, et cetera. That doesn't require great artistic skills. It requires understanding people. And there was a citizen group that actually did wonderful work about preventing all this. And they didn't prevent it with signs saying, don't do it. They prevented it by saying, hmm, they throw their garbage there because it looks like a place to throw garbage. So suppose we cleaned it up and we planted new plants and suppose we painted the fence. No one's going to urinate on a freshly new painted fence and no one's going to throw garbage in a really neat area. So they had citizens that did all this and it was very effective. So where am I going in all this? <laughs> you can summarize it, but all of this is a different kind of design and it requires a different way of thinking. And I, that's what we have to do because we do have to think, realize we're part of this complex world, but we can't solve, we can't attack the world. We have to attack the small pieces. So we have to be careful in choosing appropriate pieces. But if we have a billion people in the world, we could attack millions of different areas. And that's what is happening. The problem is that people don't have long-term views. And so that was one of the things that I, that sort of jumped out at me is you know how how can how can design help us actually change um, what we what we value in the long term versus the short term? How can it help us? I'm, I'm cautious about using the word incentive, given we were talking about economists before, but designing incentives <laughs> in a in the big design sense, not in in the um, in in a in a pure sort of methodological perspective, but um, designing incentives or designing values, designing ways of of helping people emotionally connect with um, a different kind of future, a different kind of problem, because as a group of individuals, it's often more it's easier to to just ignore or to retreat to your own 
um, social circle where those problems may not exist or or whatever the the the, the solution of the day is but organizing uh, a whole society around fixing some of these problems which I agree with you are far more pressing than they were a couple of decades ago um, as resources get scarcer um, it, it we're our own worst enemy but how do we design ways to not think that way and how do we empower the designers to actually be able to act in a way that you so uh, so accurately said has been difficult right if the designers are stuck in the middle they aren't in the boardrooms how do they actually become effective enough well and, empowered and enough? not not in not in institutions of government or yeah. democracy either yeah well um <clears throat> i have directions i don't have answers and uh, actually i I've given a couple of talks to her. There was a, I gave a talk in India to a school I'd never, ever heard of. And the students asked such a wonderful question. And for the, usually when people ask me questions, I can answer them. And these students asked me questions and I would say, I don't know the answer. And, but I had to stop at one point to, to tell the students what I meant by this. And I said, and this is what I'm going to say to you in part. You asked some really good questions, and I don't know the answer. And But that's what's so good about your question, because if you ask the really f- deep, fundamental questions, nobody knows the answers. Those are the questions that we must answer. They're essential to answer, but I don't know the answer. But it's not because I don't know. It's because nobody knows. And so how do we do it? What do we do? And um, I, I also say this, that, look, people are really good at responding to disaster, but they're not very good at trying to prevent it in the first place. And so the, there's good news and bad news about climate change. And the, the bad news is that it's here and it's causing havoc and it's causing floods and fires and famine and, and et cetera, et cetera. And so the good news is that climate change is already here and it's causing floods and fires and famine and et cetera. Because now that it's really here and affecting almost everybody in the world, people are taking it seriously. So one solution is you basically make it really uncomfortable for people not to change. But the other one is you could do change. People do change over time, but it takes a while. And there is this other problem is that often the kinds of changes that we have to make will be detrimental to many people, especially people in power. And uh, so they resist it. And we can see that, look, the United Nations have a meeting like for every year for the last 20 some odd years to do climate change. And they have 119 nations and they must all agree, which is unfortunate because you can't get agreement without watering down what you're going to say. But, um, but then they, everybody assigns and agrees and they go back home and it's presidents of nations and prime ministers of nations, leading politicians of the nations. But they get back home Half of them just ignore what they've signed. They're not going to do anything. But we'll just take a look at President Biden, who signed the last one. And he comes back home and he says, here's what we need to do in this world to fight what's happening in the climate. He can't get it through a Congress. And uh, because of, it's going to make a difference to the people in power. It's going to hurt the people in power and change their business. And it's going to hurt a lot of people. They will may, probably will lose jobs. Uh, and um, we don't have the will to face that. But over time, we will. Over time, we will. We've all changed our behavior before the life. Of, we can't live without computers today. But what did we do before them? It took a long time for people to get used to it and using it. It wasn't easy. And men, it used to be that men could not type. It was only women who typed. It was a woman's skill. Why we divided skills up between what a man can do and what a woman could do. Well, men were mechanical and women weren't. And I kept saying, well, men can't use sewing machines or washing machines and women can. How come? I mean, that's more mechanical than most of what men do. But it's bizarre. But it has changed. That has changed. But that proves that a lot of things can change. But it's slow and difficult. It is. Uh, you're, yeah, you're reminding me that, of course, I learned to type because I went to public school in the 70s in New Jersey, and everybody had to take a typing class. That that definitely dates me to actually have a <laughs> typing class. You know, I think I took typing class the exact same that I took typing the, for the exact same year I first programmed an Apple II. 
Um, so there you go. You put those two things together. Um, well, I got, I got, I refused to t- learn typing and I got thrown out of sewing and giving extra physics classes. And then you ended up in, in engineering. So there you go. <laughs> yes. And I ended up in history. So <laughs> there you, that's our mix. Um, I'm interested in, you talked about complex systems and your, one of your recent, if not your most recent book was, um, you know, titled Complexity. Um, it's somewhere over there on the shelf. Um, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that, especially in terms of the challenge for designers in designing uh, a solution to a complex problem. You talked about feed forward networks and I'm curious how you think about that, you know, in terms of designing for something that is always changing um, and that, that sort of nature of the complex problems that you're trying to solve as we design for a better world, all of the things you're talking about, they're constantly moving and changing. So it, it's, it implies that we need a new sort of iterative long-term view of what design's role is. That it's not a thing that you go and there's a project and a brief and here's the design and here's my deliverable. There has to be some sort of longer term engagement, it feels like, in order to be able to be effective. That, that's not a question. That's a book. <laughs> and uh, because the answer, <laughs> to, to address it, all the different points is indeed uh, not even a book. It's multiple books. And I could talk for hours on it, but let me see if I can start a little bit. Um, First of all, it's never been the case that when we design something, that's it. See, we design a simple thing. Yeah. No, because, I don't know, let's start with the automobile. I could start it with any place. I could start with the first, you know, weaving factories in the Industrial Revolution. Because what that did was increase slavery. Uh, and... Um, because where did the cotton come from? It, it, it was the cotton mills were in England. England doesn't grow cotton, so where did the cotton come from? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but even the automobile was. First of all, people knew, didn't know what to make of it, and it was going to be only for the rich, only for occasional trips. And you had to sort of you had if you look at a lot of the old pictures. There's a person driving the car, but there's a person mechanic sitting as a passenger along with them because uh, the cars were always breaking down. And in the cities like New York City, it was basically all filled with, with horseshit. And uh, so the car was going to eliminate that pollution. And they were right. There's no more. There's not horseshit covering the streets of the major cities. It was tons of it, literally tons. Uh, but nobody realized that there would be a different kind of pollution created. And it used to be that the people were still in, in charge and that you had to wave a flag in front of the car so people would, would realize it was coming and all that. But no, the car then dominated. And soon people were second-class citizens and had to make way for the car. But who could have predicted that? Nobody, because you have to assume this barely, barely operable automobile but required, didn't last long, didn't go fast, uh, broke down all the time. Uh, we're going to be, people would own, an individual might own several of them and all around the world, there would be billions and billions and it would actually change the climate as a result and lead to whole new industries, especially the oil industry and, and the paving industry. If we would pave over so much of the country. So simple things actually make a big, big difference. And it's always been the case. And you never can make a device that if it's a really great device, people use it in ways you never dreamed of, and therefore you have to change it. So it may be the perfect device, except when they start using it in different ways, it's no longer perfect. And so, yeah, complexity theory, complexity theory is all about nonlinearities and about unexpected uh, happenings. But um but I think that's true of the world in general, and it always has been, and we know that, and, and clever entrepreneurs always take advantage of that. But um, the way you deal with complexity is, is that, look, how does science study complexity? Um, the way you have to study something if you're a scientist is you have to isolate a part that you can handle and understand, and you, and you have to make some simplifying assumptions and how do you us isolate something when your whole theory is that you can't isolate, that it's all a complex interconnected network? Well, what you do is you kind of figure out 
well, these things have, are connected to that, but not very strongly. So I can break that bond. So you try to find a little area that is mostly self-contained and the, the other ones are weaker. And, and actually how you divide it up depends upon what problem you're, you're studying. Because you, the very same elements might have different interactions. If I'm looking at energy usage, it might be one set of divisions. And if I'm looking at uh, people's ability to, I don't know, keep themselves warm and heat it up properly, that's another set and so on. So what we what people are good at are small linear systems. And so, and actually that includes scientists. If you take a look at mathematics, it makes horrible oversimplifications. And so uh, I'm not in favor of mathematical models because of the simplification you've had to make to even do what, what is amounts to really complex mathematics. The ones I like are agent-based models. If you want to understand thermodynamics, instead of having equations that try to average everything together, I take a, I model each molecule. Uh, and I show how it interacts with things around it. And then I, de- then I have to put millions or little or billions of these into my model and see what happens. Well, we couldn't do that a long time ago, but today we can. So we're starting to be able to make models. But now that we make a model with these billion different actors, we can put it together and see exactly how they interact and what the implications might be. But if somebody asks us why, uh, well, um, gee, I don't know. But <laughs> look, look at a neural network. Uh, as we all know, neural networks are very, seem to be very powerful. They're great pattern recognition devices. But when you ask the person who wrote the neural network, people who wrote the, the neural network, why it made that decision, they don't know. Because they say, well, there's, you know, five million weights in there. That is, there's a numerical value. And it's because that combination led with this input led to that result. But why? Well, we don't know. There are millions and millions. How do we know how that works? So when you're using a neural network to to try to understand the brain, well, the brain can't. is very hard to understand because it's this complex network. And if we build this complex network to understand the brain and we show that it works similar in a very similar way, it's different, but similar to the brain, well, yeah, it's also similar that we can't know how it works either. We have to make really simplified models. But, you know, a lot of very simplified models are a network of themselves. And I think that's how we progress. We look at the little local thing and we try to improve things. Now, it's quite often that making something better locally makes things worse globally. So we have to be aware of that. But I'm giving the, this is my standard answer to these kinds of questions. Of course, if you, Listen to everything I said. What I really said was, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you mentioned neural networks, so I would like to ask, um, uh, have a bit of your perspective on on AI. Um, you talk about it towards the you know, through, actually throughout the book. Um, there's definitely a section and a chapter on it later in the book, and I'm sort of curious how you think about it. It is something that is. Um, uh, you know, we're sort of at the beginning of seeing what it might be. And what I'm interested in mostly is sort of your reflection as you think about designing for a better world, um, how we think about what to do about this new technological beast that's being unleashed. You know, um, it, you know how, do, how do you think about making recommendations to people or guidance to designers who are involved in AI, if, if they have enough impact on it to make it be a good thing that actually leads to a better world rather than be yet again, another human invention that, that, that has, you know, a negative impact or destructive impact even. Recognizing that that's a really big question. I recognize it's a really big question. And now you're going to tell me that, yes, this is the subject of an entire book or maybe a few books. Well, so like multiple it. books. <laughs> But all I'm that's curious true. Here. All that's true. But I've given a lot of thought because actually, you may not know that I've been in the field of AI for a long time. I published in the AI mm-hmm. journals. Yep. But I, what I, what I, the work I did, in fact, with Terry Winograd in part, Danny Barbro, and the people at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, was what's called good old fashioned AI. 
And what we were trying to do was to understand the meeting structures. And so we had these networks of semantic networks, we called them, trying to understand how things are related to each other in a meaningful way so they could answer questions that were meaningful because it understood the questions at a deep level. And uh, the problem with it, though, is trying to hand code and put this all into the, in those old early computers. Uh, there was no way we could scale to anything reasonable. And that's where Terry Winograd wrote this wonderful language program where you could say, uh, pick up the red block and put it over there and using pronouns and and so on, where that's really hard to understand. So what do you mean there? Uh, pick up the red block and I see three red blocks and et cetera, et cetera. So, but he managed to do that. But as he pointed out, he did that because he was in a controlled situation with with a particular kind of device, namely blocks of several different colors and piles and a robot arm that could pick them up and move them, that's not the real world. And once you get to the real world, none of these systems work. But it was a beginning. Now, neural networks, I like to think, were invented in my laboratory. Um, one version of them was. And I like to tell the story as I was one day talking, we had a group of new postdocs coming in and I was going to tell them some of the history of what we were doing. And I talked about the perceptron, which was an early network and it has very great limitations. And there was a wonderful book by Seymour Papert and Marvin Minsky saying what they were fundamentally limited in what they could ever do. And while I was talking, one of the postdocs, Jeff Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton, basically said, no, you're all wrong. And he took the chalk out of my hand. We didn't have whiteboards in those days, we had chalkboards. And it told us about some of the interesting work going on in England, which was having a whole, a whole different approach to it. And David Rummelhart, who was one of my colleague, who uh, got really excited by that, and he and Jeff worked together. I was actually directing a team that was inventing, if you like, human-computer interaction before it existed. And uh, they did. They started realizing that, oh, the perceptron is a bunch of cells, but if you took these cells and you had another group down here and then you put a third group in between and then you interconnected them, suddenly with the objections that Papert and Minsky had no longer held. And this thing was really powerful. And you could do simple pattern recognition. And that was the beginning. Jeff Hinter now is known as one of the major folks in AI. And uh, But at that time, it, it's interesting. Listen, I met with him recently at Google where he now works, uh, they bought his company. And um, I said, Jeff, you invented deep learning. So what was the theoretical breakthrough that allows you to do that? And he said, there wasn't any. The theoretical breakthrough was that in, what, 15, 20 years later, the computers were like a million times more powerful. And they could do things that we could never even imagine a computer doing in the early days. And so that's what the breakthrough was. So, but it's still the same pattern recognition. It recognizes patterns. And you feed it all the, all the literature in the world that reads it, and it simply looks for patterns. It has no, one, no knowledge, no understanding. So the good old AI folks, good old fashioned AI folks, were trying to make an understanding. And I think that we have to combine the two. And so I just, really, I'm doing a sense of, bunch of videos based on my book for the Interaction Design Foundation. And they just released about a three minute video part where I talk about AI. And I say, in AI, I want you to remember the letter A. The letter A is artificial. It's not the same as our intelligence. It's a different kind, it's pattern matching. And on top of that, we're in its infancy. So when you see that it does all sorts of weird and destructive things, look, it's in its infancy. We are learning. We're learning now how to stop that and how to discourage that and so on. But it's a tool that's going to make our lives better. And there's some good examples then when um, Autodesk started devising the first generative AI systems. The story they tell me was that they wanted one of a designer to use it real famous designer, please use this. We want to get your feedback. And he said, no, I refuse to. I can do it by myself. I don't want some stupid machine trying to do something for me. And I said, please, we help us. Just use it for a month and then just tell us what you think is wrong and why it's no good. Uh, 
And he did. And at the end of the month, they came back and they said, okay, we need it back. And uh, we want you to your opinion. And he said, I won't let you take it back. I don't ever want to do design in a different way. And if it's, it's kind of like the story about why a calculator, which used to be banned from schools, because how could you learn arithmetic with calculators? Well, the problem with my doing arithmetic and, and, or mathematics, it could be arithmetic or it could be algebra or it could be solving uh, calculus problems, is I make mistakes. And what's nice, but, but what I'm good at and what people are good at is devising the problem in the first place and setting up what the equations ought to be or how you want to approach it. Let the system solve it. So the modern calculators that solve all these problems are wonderful because I can, I can solve, I can work on the problem so much faster. I get the answer in seconds and I can see it's wrong. It's not what I cared about. And so I have to learn to modify what I, my, the way I'm formulating the question or maybe bring in new information that I didn't have, didn't think was relevant before. And, um, it made us, it made people more powerful at doing these problems. I took a course in rockets when I was at MIT. And this is the days before computers. We had slide rules. I don't even, I won't bother to explain it. A mechanical device, so you could compute, you could add, subtract, do trigonometry uh, accurate to three digits. Three digits. If it was, if it was more than 300, you, you, there was no, well, any, once you got into the hundreds, there were no decimal places left because it's only three digits. Um, and we were given homework of problems, and we would go home and we would work for a week to come back and solve it. And invariably, everybody was wrong because they made stupid little arithmetic or simple other kinds of errors along the way. Today, that homework problem, you just feed it to the computer and boom, there's the answer. So you could be, so you would never get that problem. The instruction would give you much greater important problems that looked at the larger story and allows you to do so much more. And if you if you look at the people who've used the new AI tools successfully, either in writing or in making drawing pictures, or people who've won prizes with their with the drawings that came out, and they were and people complain, oh, you just had a computer do it. And the person said, No, it's true, the computer did it, and I could never have done it my myself, but I took, it took me a month to do that because I, I, I had to coach it and modify it. It's like I had a, an intelligent human assistant who I asked to do something and they don't do what I really had in mind. So I have to go back and explain what I want. And I have to change. Actually, I changed. I realized what I had in mind was the wrong way of expressing it. And so we had to work together. It's a collaboration. And I think that's what the future is. That some of the skills that we now have, especially the artistic skills, will go away. We don't need that. And the shading skills, where you have to shade every line and so on, we don't need that anymore. We already have that. Machines can do rendering far better than people. So did that get destroy artists? No. Destroy it because what you now sit back and you conceptualize the problem. You know, photography, did that destroy art? No. It gave us new insight. But when it first came out, people assumed it would destroy art. And so I, I'm i very optimistic and I want to rec- and I'm not denying all of the all of the evil things that could result from this. I'm especially terrified of war, where the AI systems will take over. And it doesn't matter, we could refuse to use AI to make decisions that would kill people. But if the enemy is doing it. We have no choice because their machines can respond so much faster than one that has a person making the decisions. And that scares me. But but every technology has, has had those kinds of properties that are used for evil and they're used for good. And it's and in the beginning, you don't really know. One of the things I uh, constantly am fascinated about with AI is its ability to reflect ourselves back to ourselves. Um, whether at a societal level and thinking about, um, you know, the way that it's exposed um, bias and data sets in such a way that we've had to reason much more precisely about fairness and um, about the way that algorithms work in society, but right down to, to self-improvement kind of AI. Um, things like, a you know, 
an Apple Watch, but also um, what we can what we can have as AI assistants that help us um, be the kind of people we want to be. And um, you're talking. We were talking earlier about you know setting a goal, and off off the, the AI goes to sort of solve towards that goal. And and I'm curious about how you've thought about this sort of um, design of human behavior when the human still has control over that and is able to still have agency over their own values and goals. They're not captured by them. It's not um, something that is um, that's that's nefarious particularly, but just designing good products for um, individuals to improve themselves, whether they want to get better education or um, make better, healthier choices. But that's sort of that almost a, a, a metacognitive partner, almost a coach, and how you've thought about um, the the ways to go about those those kinds of designs that that um, can really bring out the best of both the human and the machine. I think there are some areas where I think that we could, it wouldn't be difficult to make coaches that improve us, it's especially learning um, cognitive skills and anything that's cognitive. Um, but there are some things that require the body. Um, I can't learn to cook by just watching television or, or uh, even an intelligent coach telling me I have to cook because um, there are all sorts of factors. That, well, you know, uh, there are all sorts of things where I can't, I can't be a better tennis player without playing tennis, but having a coach that's watching me and telling me um, that, no, I need to practice this and then showing me a picture of what I, what I looked like versus what I should look like. That would be very valuable, but I, and the coach could be a machine because it's, it's you, you, whether or not it's better to have a human coach doesn't matter because there aren't enough human coaches to go around. And I, uh, moreover, most of us couldn't afford to hire a human coach, but a machine would be less expensive. And uh, and actually, are probably good coaches, good human coaches, who use the machines. They already do. They already take photographs, and they use them to analyze what your swing, the way you walk, the way you do things, and feed them back to you. And if you want to do a complex... I just started to watch this weird movie, the Indian movie called RRR, which is as you may know, very, very popular and so on. And it's a three hour movie and it's wonderfully choreographed and I think wonderfully filmed. The, the, the story is completely trite and overdone and it shows the British war, ma- the British overmasters over India as incredibly stupid and biased and horrible and horrific. And I don't care how bad the British really were. It couldn't have been that bad. And, uh, <laughs> but, but the point is, that movie could not have been made without very complex computer analysis. And, uh, and that's making the movie, it's making the techniques of doing movie making much better. Uh, it was actually also used to analyze the choreography to make sure that worked because it's pretty incredible what they are doing. Um, and some of the, some of the is actually computer animations. The animals are all mostly computer animation. You can't really tell. They had to tell you in the beginning of the movie not to worry. It's an animation because it looks so real. But uh, the script, no, it could use help. And um, so I, I think that we will have good computer coaches that will help us. And I think that the people who are worried today, oh, people are going to cheat in their exams because they just have a computer do it. They're giving the wrong exams. Hmm. And personally, I think cheating is good. I've, I've argued that people, we want to teach people how to cheat. And the problem with cheating in school is that we, we want to insist on grading everybody by themselves and having they do the work all by themselves. But in real life, well, look, at two of you are sitting there, not one. And that, that makes it a better interview, actually. And on top of that, there's all the stuff behind you that other people have had to make work and so on. Uh, and the editing facilities you're going to use. Um, so why are we teaching people 
we should be teaching them teamwork. And I want them to cheat. And that is to say, if you're asked to write an essay, go around and ask your friends if they've written an essay on the same topic and, and take parts of it away and put it into your essay. Or find, a, you know, go ask a computer program to find other essays on this topic and use them. But cheating is not permitted so you, to copy or to use somebody else's, so you have to lie about it. I want to encourage people to do it and give credit. They should say, this came from John, this came from Barry, this came from the Encyclopedia Britannica, this came from, I don't know, Wikipedia. And um, and they give the credit. And what your give, what the grade is, did you put together a good paper? Was it Was it an unusual point of view? I don't care that every paragraph came from somebody else, but you put it together in a different way. And uh, and there are other ways of doing exams and et cetera, because exams also are fake. Um, you end up with a grade, a letter grade that, what does it mean? If I got a, a B in a course, it means I didn't know everything. But if somebody else wants to know what it is that I did know and what it is I didn't know, the letter doesn't tell you. So I, I'm a firm believer in doing projects and you can see if the project was successful because the project, first of all, that's what matters, not the little details, it's the overall, but second of all, it should be done by a team. And ideally a team of not all people in the same class, you wanna bring in other classes because you get other points of view because in the world, we don't have one profession doing something. You have to have multiple professions so we have to learn to deal with that. So I think that the, the AI, there's one last sentence, and that I think the AI is going to cause us to completely rethink education, which I hope is in a positive, wonderful, creative way. I want to thank you so much. This has been a really enjoyable interview. Um, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Thank you. I, I, I too yeah. enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy our podcast, please subscribe on Substack or your favorite podcast platform. And please leave a positive rating or comment. Sharing your positive feedback helps us reach more people and connect them with the world's great minds. Seriously, a review on Apple Podcasts is a big deal. And if you like how we think, then contact us about our speaking and workshops and human-centered product design. You can learn more about us at GetSonder.com, and you can contact us at hello at GetSonder.com. You can learn more about making better decisions in our book, Make Better Decisions, How to Improve Your Decision-Making in the Digital Age. The book is an essential guide to practicing the cognitive skills needed for making better decisions in the age of data, algorithms, and AI. Please check it out at mbd.zone, on Amazon, bookshop.org, or place an order through your favorite local bookstore.